is made up of 606 feet, 606 feet, 606 feet, 606 feet, 606. It's made up of staves, exactly the same. Now, if that's not interesting enough, look at the angle of the Great Pyramid of Giza. If you take the angle of the Great Pyramid of Giza, the slope is 51.8 degrees. Let's go back to the earthworks. If you measure the line that goes straight through the center of the structure, right here, and then you go true north, it's 51.8 degrees. That angle is exactly the same angle as the pyramids of Giza. It is the same math, the same calculations as ancient Egyptians. Let me show you one more connection. In 1860, David Wyrick, he's a guy who surveyed the Newark earthworks. He was digging into a mound near those earthworks and he found a wooden coffin made of oak. They opened up the coffin and found a skeleton of a man holding a little box. It was about 8.10 inches in size. The box had been cemented shut here. This, by the way, is sitting in Ohio. Well, he opened up the box and he found a little man inside, a little black stone. They took it to scholars and they looked at it. The man seems to be carrying something and there's writing here at first they couldn't recognize. The writing is, they thought in 1860, some sort of Hebrew. Well, finally, about 20 years later, they found some rabbis living in the area and the rabbis looked at that and they could read it. They said it was an old, old kind of block Hebrew, uh, block Hebrew, and it was a rendition of the Ten Commandments. Now, this is another piece. Block Hebrew, they said they'd never seen anything like it. Mainstream archeologists at the time called this a hoax. But then in 1900, or just about after 1900, in Israel, they found the same block style Hebrew writing. Mainstream archaeologists still dismissed the findings. They found it in Israel and they found it in Ohio. But there was another stone that they found that they couldn't argue. This is the Bat Creek Stone. It was found during the course of an official Smithsonian evacuation. The Smithsonian didn't understand the, uh, uh, the meaning of the writing on the stone. They thought it was Cherokee since it came from Cherokee country. They didn't realize that it's actually Hebrew. They had published this originally upside down. They threw it in a box at the bottom of the Smithsonian, put it in the basement. Many years later, a scholar took it out of the box, looked at it, and went, oh my gosh, it's upside down. It's Phoenician, ancient Hebrew. So what's going on here? What is that about? Where is that history? I'll show you in a few minutes and we're going to have a conversation and I'm going to show you some more things that the Smithsonian science, government, commerce colluded to erase. By the way, I want to thank the directors of the documentary Lost Civilizations of North America for bringing these stories to my attention. I was blown away. To find more, visit the website lostcivilizationdvd.com. Here's the thing we should be asking ourselves. I don't know the story of these. Do you know, did you know that? Do you live in Ohio and did you know that? Why not? Were the American Indians wronged? Yes. Yes. And that's what we focus on in America. Is we were bad to the American Indians. Forget about it. It's in the past. The question should be the ones that the founders asked. Who are they? What knowledge do they have? Can you imagine the difference we would have now if we would put our differences aside and put our past in the past and concentrate on today and say, let's learn from each other. What do you have? What is that? What is that? Roger Williams, founder of the First Baptist Church in America in the mid-1600s, believed that indigenous people were not only fellow seekers, but that, quote, the Indians were probably of Jewish descent of the lost tribes of Israel. Later, many other artifacts would turn up that suggested the presence of Middle Eastern cultures in North America. Protestant priests, Catholic fathers, um, uh, Jewish rabbis uh, were seeing these possible links between the, uh, the Native Americans and ancient Israel. 
These links included written records that uh, had possible tie-ins to the ancient world. Uh, there were certainly religious beliefs, uh, thinking that the Native Americans may have been descendants of some Hebraic, Jewish, Israelite travelers to, to the Americas at different times, uh, or of other old world peoples at different times. And there are various things uh, uh, fueling these. There were religious, political, and social agendas. Perhaps the largest documented religious artifact was this ancient city wall mound, recorded in Squire and Davis's Smithsonian publication entitled Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley. So to see an artifact like that, or the context in which they would place an artifact like that, would be, especially something found in association with the mounds, would be, oh, that shows to us the presence of these people at that time here in the Americas. They were responsible for creating that artifact. They were responsible for creating the mounds and for introducing various cultural aspects into the Americas. The idea that ancient inhabitants knew of and used Middle Eastern Hebrew symbols undermined the notion that Native Americans were isolated savages. It also conflicted with the emerging science of the day and would mark the beginning of a long-standing no connection to them. What happened to these written records? But it is another irony that we find that um, we're said to not have any kind of written language um, or history, and it's all stored in the shelves of the museums. But every museum, small or big, has a great quantity of stuff that is boxed up that hasn't seen the light of day for literally 100 years. And we've had the American Indian Religious uh, Freedom Act in this country. You know, in 1978, supposedly we can practice our religion freely. However, our religion is intimately tied with the knowledge that's written on those scrolls, many of which are held in museums that we don't ha even have. Again, there's this irony of saying no written language, no sophistication, etc., etc., but yet there sure is something that museums want to hold on to. In fact, artifacts containing what appears to be written language excited great controversy when they were originally discovered. According to the scholarly journal of the Ohio Historical Society, quote, no subject received more attention or stirred more controversy among archaeologists in the 19th century than the authenticity and presumed meaning of the engraved stone tablets that were periodically recovered from the mounds. Some members of the Ohio Association were among the staunchest defenders of a so-called lost race theory, and many had little doubt that the mound builders were descended from one of the ancient civilizations of Europe or the Middle East, most likely the seafaring Phoenicians of Hebrew or Mediterranean origin. Was the scientific community reacting to these origin ideas? Dr. Stephen Pete may have thought so, and actually charged wanton destruction of the mounds. Whether intentional or not, whether motivated by religious or political agendas or not, modern experts agree that wanton destruction did occur. Manifest destiny, the idea that American First Nations had never achieved anything worth preserving has resulted in the wanton destruction of thousands and thousands of earth constructions, mounds, embankments, figures, and settlements. So we have lost incalculable amount of archeological data because of no appreciation of their value for historical purposes. I think the origins of our pattern of Obliteration uh, and ignorance of the past of ancient America lies in two ways. First, we thought as a nation that we were starting something brand new. Our founding documents are full of new start, new page, new everything, new order of the universe, we say in our national sale. Powell had become a national hero for exploring part of this new land, the treacherous Colorado River. But what he is not as well known for was his defining of the origin and evolution of Native Americans. Uh, he was more interested in uh, putting to rest what he called a mound builder myth, the idea that these mounds had not been built by the 
prehistoric ancestors of North American Indians. There were some people who were arguing that the mounds had not been built by any of the existing groups of North American Indians and they would use the, words uh, use the word race indiscriminately. There were others who did argue that no, these were um, non-Indian peoples in a biological sense and that they were built by Europeans. But Powell was, uh, what Powell really wanted to do, he, he had a research agenda at the uh, Bureau of American Ethnology and that was he wanted to unite archaeology and ethnology in the common study of American Indian. And so what Powell wanted to do was break the idea down that, you know, that archaeology and ethnology in other words, studying living cultures, studying living cultures of North American Indians, and then you know, studying them on their own terms, documenting them as they exist now, but also then looking at archaeology, not as, not as studying the record of some exotic European culture that was once here, but looking at archaeology in light of ethnology, that this was an earlier, this was an earlier stage of existence among North American Indians. The Powell agenda forced artifacts to be viewed only through the lens of currently observable savage Indian culture. Was this an artificial barrier to science? We would say that's bad science, where you want to discount information because it kind of doesn't fit what, what you think you see. And what you think you see is, of course, all informed by all these theories and ideas and what you've been told. And what you see is what people saw at the time were these savages who were in this pitiful state. Powell's vision of 19th century evolution was that Native Americans had evolved in North America for millions of years to a state less advanced than that of European immigrants. Robbing Native Americans of their history before Columbus may have served two purposes. First, justifying manifest destiny and the displacement of Native Americans. And second, Dismissing of popular religious ideas that ancient Native Americans may have had Middle Eastern origins and thus rights equal to those of European immigrants. Powell wrote, Whether we desire it or not, the ancient inhabitants of this country must be lost, and we may comfort ourselves in the reflection that they are not destroyed, but are gradually absorbed and become part of a more civilized community. So when that's what your framework is, um, of course, then, it makes sense in, in a way, as troubling as it is, um, and the, the racism, really, that, that we're talking about uh, is so deep there. Um, it, it, it does make sense that that's your worldview. That's what you've been told. So none of this data fits. Rather than looking all of the data and trying to determine what story can we put together, what can we understand, um, from this data. I think that's what happened. I think very clearly people um, were willing to discount things that didn't fit what they could see, which was native people in this, uh, you know, pitiful, savage, wild state in, in, as they were viewed by Europeans.